Tonight at 6, growing concerns about the safety of Boeing's newest plane after two major crashes now in just six months. And a wild shootout caught on camera in Southern Oregon. Hear from the witness who watched it all go down. One year after a massive fire sent Portland families running for their lives, the scrapyard that went up in flames is still a huge mess. But the legal loophole that allowed it could soon change. KGW News at 6 starts now. And we begin tonight with an arrest in the small community of Sherwood. A married piano and guitar teacher, the son of a city councilor, facing very serious sex abuse allegations from one of his young students. And police say it happened at the music school owned by his parents. Let's bring in KGW reporter Nina Melhoff. She's on the story for us tonight. I can't help but notice this comes at a time when a lot of us have been talking about this sort of thing, sex abuse allegations and, and the whatnot. Uh, documentaries like uh, Michael Jackson, we've seen the stuff on Netflix, true crime dramas. R. Kelly has been in the news. Nina. Yeah, Dan, there's been a lot of focus recently on child sex abuse, how a predator grooms a kid, even their family, where everyone likes and trusts that person. Now, we don't know the details of what happened in this case, but experts say more awareness is going to make parents better able to spot abuse. 29 year old Chris Griffin bailed out of jail on some tough charges, sodomy, sexual penetration and sex abuse of a child. The alleged abuse happened at his parents business and private home where he taught piano and guitar called Let's Make Music and Dance. Sherwood police saying a longtime student of his came forward Thursday and search warrants found enough evidence to make an arrest. His mom writing, while we feel terrible for anything that happened to this child, Christopher is innocent and he will be exonerated in court. Just to make everyone comfortable, Christopher will not be working here while the charges are pending. He has no criminal past. It's like hanging out with a friend that's more your age just kid things. They were just doing kid things. It comes at a time when America is debating the documentary Leaving Neverland about Michael Jackson's alleged child sex abuse, along with surviving R. Kelly with accounts from underage girls that the singer abused them and the jaw droppingly true Netflix documentary abducted in plain sight that goes into graphic detail of how a predator grooms a whole family to have sex with a young girl. We became very good friends. He was so engaged with the kids, too. I mean, he really was fun. and He could give me a great feeling about myself. I was attracted to him. Now, the more information that's out there and the more it's brought out into the light, I think the better. Brian Longworth is a licensed professional counselor in Tigard. He says most predators have practiced grooming techniques for years. Most of the offenders that I worked with, I'm not sure that they actually consciously thought through that because they were lying to themselves as much as they were the kids, a lot of them would think of this as a loving relationship. It just happened to be with a 10 year old. And that's why a lot of young kids don't recognize it as abuse, like the men in Levy Neverland. There's no thoughts of this is wrong or anything like that. Longworth says kids don't know anything about sex, but they trust the person and feel loved, so it must be okay. But he says unless there's a custody dispute where a parent has put a kid up to lying, they're usually always telling the truth about abuse because they wouldn't risk the embarrassment. One of the things that makes people not believe kids is, well, why did they wait? Or sometimes kids go back and forth on whether they're, they're saying the person did it or not, or they change details or whatever. It's a really scary thing that they've gone through. And it's even more scary almost sometimes to be telling people about it. So to have them not be straightforward and be scared about it and all of that, that's, that's pretty normal. Okay, so check out some tips for parents from our counselor. He says don't cut to the chase and just ask a child if they've been touched. They'll just clam up. He says you've got to get them talking first. So instead, start generally asking how do you feel about so and so? What kinds of things do you talk about? Do they ever make you feel uncomfortable? He says the child will start to open up and talk, then slowly reveal anything that happened. Other advice, he says, never leave your kid alone with an adult you don't know very well. He says, if it's a one-on-one -on -one situation like a math tutor or a music teacher, pop by unexpectedly to their lesson or ask to sit in on a lesson. If you get excuses or pushback, you know there's a reason, and that is when you should start asking those important questions. Dan, back to you. Nina, thank you.
I'm going to tell you about a deadly shootout between deputies and a suspect in Douglas County. All of it, as you can see, caught on camera. Yeah, deputies say it started when they saw a possible stolen car filled with weapons and ammunition at a truck stop near Roseburg. KGW's Kyle Boshi joins us from the newsroom to break down just what happened there. Kyle? Kathy's officers approached the stolen car the driver took off. Police chased after him until the driver got stuck in a field near Roseburg. Take a look. You can see the shootout in a farmer's field between officers and the suspect. Eventually, the car burst into flames. Investigators say they later found a body inside the car. No officers were hurt. The woman who shot this video says she didn't realize how intense it would get when she started recording on her cell phone. Total shock. I, the, with the adrenaline, I wasn't as worried until afterwards when the cops had contacted me and thought, oh, geez, you know, this is really bad. At this point, police still haven't been able to identify the driver of that stolen car, but they have released these photos. Take a close look. Investigators hope someone recognizes the man. Again, they don't know who he is or why he had a car filled with weapons and ammunition. Back to you. Kyle, thank you. A year ago tomorrow, a massive fire at a Northeast Portland auto salvage yard sent families just running for their lives. Several homes were destroyed. Little has changed at the scrapyard. Many blame a loophole in the law. But as KGW's environmental reporter Keely Chalmers found out, there's a new law being considered that could change that. This is what it looked like on the morning of March 12th of last year in the Culley neighborhood of Northeast Portland. Flames shooting into the sky, smoke billowing around nearby homes. The massive five alarm fire ignited inside Northwest Metals, an auto salvage yard. That day was crazy. I, I was hearing a lot of commotion and I looked out my bedroom window and just saw flames. The yard sits directly behind Melanie Harper's home. We were evacuated and um, had to get our animals out. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. It was wild. The fire burned down several homes in this area. Today, some are being rebuilt. And despite a DEQ inspection that found the yard in violation of several of its permits, neighbors say nothing has changed at the scrap yard. You still see the cars are stacked up. So, you know, it, it, it's a little unnerving that why are they still stacked up? Which is why Oregon lawmakers are now considering a bill that would close the loopholes that allow scrapyards like this to continue operations. So right now, uh, in order to operate, an auto dismantler needs to get a certificate from the DMV. And so this would attach um, permitting issues and oversight to that certificate, and the DMV could revoke it. But many want an even tougher bill, one that would give the DEQ greater oversight on businesses like this across the state. Right now, the bill actually won't do as much as we're hoping it will. But for neighbors who live next door to these salvage yards, like Melanie, it's at least a start. Definitely something, something should be done to where they can't store that kind of stuff, that much stuff, and because um, it devastated a lot of people. Now, we did try to get a hold of the supervisor here at Northwest Meadows. However, he did not return our phone calls. Meantime, lawmakers will hold their first hearing on Senate Bill 792 tomorrow. In Northeast Portland, Keeley Chalmers, KGW News. Now to a follow-up on our Classrooms in Crisis investigation. Today, teachers push lawmakers to spend tens of millions of dollars on mental health services for students. KGW investigator Kristen Severance joins us with details of this plan. Kristen? Yeah, so we've been taking a really hard look at disruptive incidents happening in classrooms across Oregon. You know, it, we've really heard now from hundreds of teachers about the rise in these incidents. They're verbal, physical, sometimes violent incidents happening in schools. We've also heard about the severe lack of school counselors and mental health services for students. Today, 17 people testified in front of the House Committee on Education, urging them to pass House Bill 2224. It would direct the Department of Education to distribute $83 million in grants for social emotional learning, mental health services, or trauma informed care for students. Teachers told the committee what they experience every day. I had six room clears in one week um, and when I called the office I was told to deal with it and then the secretary came down 
that's the support that I have. And I've conducted countless room clears. I have stood by and watched as everything on my classroom walls has been destroyed while trying to urgently usher my students to safety in the teacher's classroom next door. I have been slapped and hit numerous times while trying to protect students from attacking others. And I have been called every vulgar name you could possibly imagine, all while teaching kindergarten. Now, Tori Dowdy, that kindergarten teacher you just heard from, she was in our first classrooms in crisis investigation. So this was just the first public hearing. It still has a long way to go before this bill would be passed. We'll continue to follow it and we'll continue to tell these stories. We have a big story coming up on Wednesday where we talk to a parent of a student really struggling with these disruptive behaviors. Guys, we'll look for your next report. Kristen, thank you. you I want to tell you about a new max line from Portland to Bridgeport Village. It's several years away, but people are already getting pretty riled up about the whole thing. KGW's Tim Gordon mm -hmm. talked to a tired businessman uh, that could have his business torn down to make way for this new line. Well, this place is called the Circuit, and it's a big bouldering gym for climbers. And it is also right in the way of what's called the 74th Avenue Alternative. In fact, the max line would cut right through the building, forcing them out. It was a crowded house at Tigard City Hall. Hosting the meeting were representatives from TriMet and cities along the line sat at the desk. And they got an earful about a plan that would switch the alignment of the proposed max tracks from Bonita down to Bridgeport Village. The folks that make up the circuit climbing community are very attached to what they have going on, which is a big open bouldering gym that hosts national competitions and is like family for locals. In five years, they've had 340,000 visits. Owner Andy Coleman wants those who could decide the circuit's fate to have the facts. And one of the major facts that I don't think very many of you know about right now is how special and important and big our climbing community is and how much the circuit bouldering gym serves the city of Tigard. I'm pretty appalled by the lack of due process. I was appalled before I got here. It's pretty unconscionable that the circuit just found out about this last week. And that woman you just heard from is an attorney representing the circuit and also Interstate Roofing, which is a pretty big company and employer with its headquarters right down here. They would be affected as well. So a lot of people spoke today, more than 30 with just a minute each to speak against this alternative. Of course, the original plan, there are people who don't like that either. So no decision anytime soon. And the debate continues in Tigard, Tim Gordon, KGW News. A stretch of Highway 101 on the southern Oregon coast is finally back open. Last month, a major slide about 12 miles north of Brookings caused the pavement to buckle and break, nearly taking out the entire road. Contractors have been working to remove the debris, put down gravel. ODOT says only one lane is open right now, but traffic is getting through. If you are headed out to the coast and taking Highway 101, ODOT says be on the lookout for flaggers on that road. Coming up here, before and after photos, we can all get behind. A viral hashtag is encouraging people to get out in their community and clean it up. Plus, a Portland company taking on anti-vaxxers with a little satire. Their creative approach to the vaccine debate coming up a little later in the show. I'm Matt Spino. Our run of clear weather is over, but it's going to be a good transition. After we get through some rain tonight and showers tomorrow, we've got a warm-up on the way. We also have a lot of new snow coming to the Cascades.